Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. What a show, I tell you every episode, but this one is incredible. You are going to want to do the drum roll as you hear everything I'm talking about. We have a guest today who is a multi-award winning filmmaker and actor from Sweden. He's been featured in Deadline Hollywood, Variety, Daily Mail, and he starred in over, wait for it, over 40 feature films and TV shows like the crime thriller Betrayed. You may know who was in that, but if not, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. And it did have a premiere in the world famous Grauman's Chinese Theater. Um, Many of you know that now as TCL, but super exciting because it was distribute its distribution was uh, by Sony Pictures. But this is big and this is so much fun. But there's so much more because he's been featured in Variety twice. And I can't even begin to tell you some of the things that he's got going on now. And that's why he's here. He's going to share some incredible things that are going on. Um, You may have let me, let me just throw out some things here and see if they ring bells with you. Kindergarten cop, uh, black Hawk down. How about saved by the bell? There's more major league. If any of these ring a bell for you, you're going to want to get to know our guest and hear what he's got going on now and then stay with him because you're going to want to hear what is coming up. And there's so much more to all of the things that I want to share with you. But with me today is Harley Wallen. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, I love being on. I love this too. I'm so excited because you have done some very incredible things. And I think so many people start when they know you and they connect with you, which you're quite well known. People are going, well, how did how did he get where he's going? So how did it start for you? Well, um, so I've always been an artist to some degree. Uh, it's just not always been acting and filmmaking. So when I was little, uh, my mom put me in martial arts at, at seven. And uh, I started doing judo and later on taekwondo. And I, I competed on a, on a national team level in two different martial arts. Um, eventually when mixed martial arts, uh, you know, like the UFC type of fighting, uh, I did that. I went pro and finished uh, with an undefeated 14 fight career. Um, so that was a part of me. I also started wow. break dancing as a teenager and uh, was the first person in Sweden to do the windmill and, uh, and, uh, was really into that and was a part of uh, some really cool events. Uh, Quincy Jones Jr.'s uh, son uh, break dances with us up in Stockholm. And uh, we opened and did some events and banquets that I, I was just breathtaking to be a part of. I started getting into the music scene when I was dancing. So I was singing and I was rapping and I released two songs at the Cannes Music Festival. So this is all before and while I was acting, I guess, to some degree. Uh, but what happened was uh, I got on a show in Sweden called Sul Stolama, and uh, I was there to be a background dancer. It was a cabaret style show. Oh my. Kind of like the Osmonds. And uh, we were supposed to be there dancing because we had musical guests. We had Samantha Fox and some of the other Kylie Minogue and, and, and some pretty big guests. And um uh, when they had one-liners, uh, you know, go buy the suntan lotion from the tanning place or whatever, they always came and asked us. And I was always fascinated by the acting. So I started doing the one-liners and I hung out with the actors. I got to find out that acting is a lot more than just pretending. Uh, and, and I fell in love with acting. Uh, yes. So that's where the acting bug bit me. And uh, literally it's never let go. I asked around found out where were the best acting coaches and acting classes. And uh, that was what I went after. After that, it was, I had one thing in mind and that was to act in film and television. That was it. This is pretty neat. And you've been, I mean, you've been featured in a lot of magazines, Tiger Beat, Variety. Tell us a little bit about that too, because this is part of your journey. Yeah, no, um, you know, I I will say uh, I'm really lucky to have Joe Williamson as my manager 
he's fantastic at, at getting uh, getting the word out. Whenever we we do a, a film or or if we announce an acquisition, uh, he he says he he says it's because of me. I think it's a lot because of him as well. Uh, but he's fantastic at getting us into the trades. I think we've been in variety two or three times. We've probably been in deadline five times now. Like you said, Tiger Beats, Daily Mail. Um, we've been featured all over the place, which is really cool. And a lot of international media. Um, the film Betrayed that you mentioned early on uh, with, with Sony and with Vision uh, is in 79 countries. And we're talking about an ultra low budget crime thriller. What? 79 countries is that wild this is crazy cool 79 countries yeah. for a low budget and this is just booming yeah i think most people don't believe the budgets uh because i not that i tell them so i don't tell my distributors either so they have to estimate it and they estimated that budget when they put it out at one and a half million dollars no so, kidding I can tell you that's not what it was. <laughs> this is definitely not what it was, uh, but the quality is there. The, the writing, the script, the, every bit of it has made something so engaging that everybody's yeah. picking up on it. But you have a, yeah. a tendency to do that and to trend in a lot of different ways. We've been fortunate, uh, I think, I really get the, the community aspect of film and I bring on board good people, good humans that are trying to do good things. Um, you can look at the films and you can say, oh, it's a crime thriller. It's a this, it's a that. But I love moral dilemmas. I love things where you, because it's so easy to say, oh, I would never kill anyone. Right. But, but, but nobody rarely, do we walk around as a good person and then kill somebody? It's usually something nips and nags at you and eventually it wears you down and then you do something that you thought you would never do. And I love presenting those moral dilemmas in, in my films. Uh, Betrayed is probably fairly, what I wanted to do in all honesty, was I wanted to scare people awake a little bit because um, <laughs> I went to, to, to my church and they were talking Michigan, which is where I live now, um, we're fifth worst in the country for human trafficking. And Ooh, I was five. completely unaware. I didn't realize and it I was number to myself, five. How can I do something here? Wow. I mean, that is, a, that's a huge number. Number five. I didn't realize it was number five. <laughs> I didn't realize that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's really a, a very interesting thing. And it's becoming I don't know where it's out there enough where people are starting to pay attention. Yeah. I love the fact that there's a movement and I do think in most of the industrialized word world, we, we, we do a good job at combating, not great, but, 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 but you can see that people want to stand up to this form of injustice very clearly but, but when I talk to friends of mine that are not from, you know, maybe the most privileged countries, this is sadly way more common than any of us would like to even, you know, think of. When you, when you think about what it's like in developing countries, um, it, it's scary here. Imagine yes. what it would be like if you were in a country that just didn't have the protections that we have here. Scary. Yes, There's it here. is. It is. And it's so important to know what's going on because mm -hmm. even though things aren't happening here per se, there are direct tie-ins to the other countries mm -hmm. because of the way that it's the trade is in that industry. Yeah. And I don't say that uh, in any form of trying to dismiss it by any means, mm -hmm. but in that world, that's what it is, is a business. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at trade, international trade. And there's a lot yeah. of um, hiding going on for things to go, mm -hmm. you know, get swept under the rug. So people can't be found or found out and yeah. uh, both being found or found out. So oh, yeah. it's really interesting. And I think that what is amazing is your focus 
You mm-hmm. have such focus on what you're doing. I just love it. Good. Yeah, it's really important to me. And, and, and there are a couple of things that I like to do. I like to leave little, uh, little Easter eggs in my films. So if you ever watch one of my films, there will be little Easter eggs from my other films. So if you're somebody who follows me, you will catch that a name of a character transfers over or is referred to from a different movie or an item from one movie is brought back in another movie. Uh, We've had that quite a few times um, and I enjoy that. And then the other thing that I really do is I like to pay homage to the people that paved the way for me. So my very first horror film, for example, I made was called Agramon's Gate. It's a demonic uh, possession style um, uh, horror thriller. And, and I'm, I, I really love the Hitchcock uh, era. I, I love the, you know, the Wes Craven era. I loved reading Stephen King and Dean Koontz as a kid um, and as a teen. Uh, so so I, I wanted to kind of pay my due to those uh, films and books that came before me and inspired me. Um, and then we made one film that's uh, due to come out that's been on the film festival circuit now called Ash and Bone. My second really coming with horror, because I wasn't a big fan of slashers unless they were smart and clever. Like I loved Nightmare okay. on Elm Street because it was a different thing. Uh, so you got slasher plus supernatural and plus all these other things. Okay. Uh, but I, but I made Ash and Bone because I really I remember seeing Texas Chainsaw Massacre and going, wow, that was different. That was really cool. Okay. Um, and then right in that era, I watched uh, you know uh, uh, some other films that had that had the same. Um, the Hills Have Eyes, uh, The House of Wax, uh, and that was the the. Ash and bonus in the breath of them. So it's always inspired from somewhere um, in real life. And uh, usually I bounce it off my teammates and I get them excited about it. So, uh, so uh, everybody kind of gets behind it and that helps move. That helps move a lot. It sure does. The more support that you get and including from a fan base, it really takes mm-hmm. on a life of its own after that. And the direction yeah. sometimes can just really be, eye-opening and awe. I mean, you're just in awe of what's happening and the way things trend. In fact, you have something that's been trending from Tubi and Plex. I'd like to hear a little bit about this. Okay. So let's, let's start with Plex, uh, because that's the horror film we just talked about. Agramon's Gate, it's on Plex, uh, and, uh, it's done really, really well. And it's a demonic, uh, it's not a traditional possession film. Uh, I think my inspiration for when I wrote that film was a, a lot of different things, but I wanted, um, what I think is missed in a lot of horror films today is mystery. I think mystery is such a crucial piece because it makes you wonder. Yes. So I wanted people to wonder. So in our story, this demon can hop and temporarily possess Oh. Um, yes, and it can even manifest as someone and not be them at all. Oh, that's very interesting. That so, takes a completely different twist here. Yeah, people said after the premiere screening, which was really because we did a couple of limited screenings before we released them and then we went on the festival run. But people said the scariest thing about the film is that you never know like who, like it could be anyone. Anyone could be the demon and anyone could be out to kill you. And they said that it just makes a, a, a real severe paranoia when you watch it because you don't know who's after you. That, I mean, it's just creepy to hear about it. So yeah. watching it is going to really get you, suck you in because you're going to be so focused on the film that anything that's going on in your periphery is no longer there. You really can get yeah. tunnel vision in something like oh, that because- yeah. It's emotionally and mentally engaging. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a good story because the, they're doing a seance to talk to, uh, through a medium, wanted to talk to, you know, people who've passed on. And uh, the demon 
latches on to the father of the lead who was killed by him when he was a child as he tried to kill his mother. Oh, this is okay. What a really, you have to really wrap your head on this one and pay attention yeah. because otherwise you could yeah. miss how this really, oh, this is interesting. That's a twister. Yeah, it is a twister. And I love that because most films, and I think there's a, a bit of a return now from watching uh, some later stuff that, that they're starting to dare to be a little edgy and, and trust that you have an audience that can put a phone away and pay attention to the film. Uh, yes, because I've yes. seen a little bit more of it coming back, but for a long time, the films were so predictable. Uh, you knew exactly what was going to, 15 minutes in, you knew the whole film. Yeah, that's been something that I think has been a big challenge for a, a really big block of time, not just mm. in the horror genre, but um, oh, yeah. across the board. Everybody's kind of sort of had the same thing going on. Same and formula over and over again. Yes, and then if they haven't done that, then they're taking a movie that's already been out and doing a remake. And so you've already yep. seen that. You already know. It's so I like that there's fresh fresh insight on something yeah. so that you can't figure out what the ending is and you've got to pay attention and get engaged tell me about Tubi also because Tubi TV's got something really cool that you've got yeah. going on there I hate to admit this but about six months ago um, my uh, my sales agent for my TV show Tale of Tales calls me up and he goes hey Harley I got this great deal Tubi wants to do an exclusive on Tale of Tales. And I'm like, awesome. What's Tubi? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. And, and the crazy thing is, the minute he said, Hart, you don't know, he's, he's like, they have 85 million monthly subscribers in the US uh, that watch on a regular basis. I had no idea how they got yes. that big. Um, uh, I guess in usage, it's you know, Netflix and Hulu and, and Disney kind of leading the way uh, with Amazon. And then it's Tubi. Yeah, like it's, it's up there. It's right up there with all those big boys. And what I really loved about it was that there's no subscription fees. It's kind of like Plex is the same way that, that you, you can watch great movies and you don't have to pay anything. And you have a little bit of advertisement. Uh, I know uh, it's like a, a minute every 20 minutes or something like that so it's not even you probably need to go bathroom anyways so yes yes, so, yes. you know what I mean or refill the drink that you get uh so I really like it but yeah our tv series got picked up uh by Tubi uh and it's called Tale of Tales and we literally trended as one of their biggest shows for almost two months um and now uh, we we uh, we're gonna go wider now where the exclusive uh, exclusive deal is over. So it's gonna come out now on on Amazon, IMDb TV, um, uh, Redbox, Voodoo, uh, as well as Tubi. So uh, whatever, if somebody doesn't want to add more to their slate and you have one of the other ones, check out Tubi. Uh, Tubi was probably one of the more fun projects I've ever engaged with. And on, on the outside, if you don't know, it looks like my project, but it was really not mine to begin with. Um, just two and a half months before we started filming, I was offered the lead role in it. And, uh, and, 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 and it's a story, if, if, if for anybody who hasn't watched it, it the story takes place at a strip club. So it's a bit of a spicy show. Okay. Um, it, it shows the kind of the, uh, the dark underworld, the writer of the series, the, the, the original writer uh, has worked in strip clubs for like the last 10, 15 years uh, while he's been an actor and a writer as well. So a lot of the stories are real stories where oh, names wow. and stuff have been exchanged. Uh, but when I read the script the first time, even though I had accepted the role, I felt that it was potentially a little, it would almost glorify this strip club a little too much. Okay. So I wanted, I wanted a little bit more give and take because if we're going to show the dirty underbelly, then let's show the dirty underbelly. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Let's be raw. Uh, so, so I wanted to touch on a few other things. So I added some elements to this. 
setting is still the same for the majority of the show, but we started talking about what other elements would we want to see in a show like this? What would enhance this to its own audience? And then we essentially re we rewrote the entire first season with that in mind. And, and oh, I wow. joined the, the writing team. Uh, uh, and then two and a half months later, we were filming, which is oh, why. That was like snap, snap. That was really fast. Ever moved. We didn't even have a script. Uh, when, like we literally, when they came to me, they had a pilot written and that was it. And we adjusted probably half of the pilot because we altered the long-term uh, uh, where the series is going. And, and, and then me and Steve, uh, the secondary writers after Tevis, me and Steve sat down and wrote this whole thing in probably three, four weeks together. We worked night and day, we were bleeding out of the eyes, but we wanted it so bad. And we had enough people behind us to back us to make this series that we wanted to, to make sure it got done and got done right. And the result of that is now that it's just taking off. So you've got to be just overjoyed at what is happening as you're watching this unfold. Absolutely. I, I think with Tales, um, the cool thing is from what, I, from what I learned, they said, you don't get a whole lot of foreign sales on TV series unless they become hits here. So that's kind of what I expected. And, and uh I think we have nine foreign deals already, and this is a three month old series. So even though we've been successful and we know that it's done well on Tubi, we, we wouldn't have enough results to even show, but people are coming saying our audience would like this. So we sold to Sky Ital Italia, which is essentially Comcast of Italy, sold to Sky France, sold to Spain, um, uh, it's been just really, Europe especially has gone pretty, uh, uh, but I, I kind of knew that the Mediterranean countries and the spicy content like this, I knew that would probably work. That's really exciting. Now, do you have some other projects on the horizon or is it too hush hush right now to tell? Um, so we, we have Ash and Bone, which is at the tail end now of its, uh, of its uh, festival run and, and Ash and Bone is, 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 it's the best work I have ever done without a doubt. I think, you know, each, each project we take a step um, every now and then we'd make a jump like for Betrayed, we made a jump. Um, for Ash and Bone, we made a jump. And, and, and that content is pretty amazing. I, 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 had, I had the pleasure to go down to Fright Fest in Kentucky and watch it with the live audience. Ooh. And we nobody knew who we were because they didn't announce us before. So so we watched this whole movie with a room full of people and and everybody stayed. Nobody walked out the entire film. Uh, and that's normally how you how you know if you have people wandering out or if they can take a bathroom break or if they hop on their phones. I didn't see anyone. Uh, that that ventured away from the film the entire time, uh, and that was pretty special. And then when we went out and talked, uh, I heard people talking about our film, telling other people when it comes out, you have to check it out. This is really exciting. There, there is yeah. just so much fun things going on, and you have just really stayed very busy and active and immersed yourself in what you love. And I want to share that with the audience because it's so yeah. important. Follow the things that you like to do. I mean, if there was a passion that you had while you were along, follow mm -hmm. it, pursue it, because it really can take you places and open up avenues of opportunity that you had no idea were going to be there. And then yeah. The result of it even can blow your mind. Like in your, I mean, you're just sitting here going, wow, look at what's happening. Yeah, it's amazing, but but that you're you're absolutely right. I think a lot of people never let go of their everyday life and take these chances because they're afraid. But okay. the way I look at it is is that you you will. It's almost like the lottery. You have no chance of winning unless you play. Um, the difference is with a lottery, you can't bet on yourself. That's one of my favorite things. 
about me is, is that I love betting on myself because I know my own work ethics. Mm -hmm. I know my energy level. I know my drive. I know my commitment. I know I control all those things. So I, I'm very confident in betting on myself. I, I've said this a million times, but we invest in our own films. And, and so when the money comes in from one film, it goes into the next and it's like a, a cycle that's always moving. And we get new investors coming in, but generally it's the same people that first started and few people getting added each film. Uh, and, and, and we're a monster now because we have so many people behind us that believe in us, but it starts with the one thing that we control. And that is a, I believe in myself enough to do it. And two, I will remain a student always. No I matter love that, no matter if I'm a professor to some, I am still a student. I still, uh, every time we shoot a new film, uh, I just got a script for a, a new story. We just shot a, a vampire movie this summer. Uh, and so all these things. But what I do when I get the script from my, uh, from my writers, I sit down and I imagine it. I imagine the whole thing as if, as if I was seeing a, a movie that I made in my mind. And then I say, how can I create this? So I go to my to my director of photography, Alex Gasparetto, and I go, Alex, so I want this shot up there and we're going to be on a crane. And he goes, we don't have a crane. I'm like, we're going to get a crane. <laughs> and, and, and I want this 20 foot dolly. And he goes, well, our dolly is only 12 feet. I'm like, we're going to get 20 foot dollies. I don't care. We're just going to do it because that's how the film, the film screams at me and says, make me this way. I uh, and love I wanna, it. I want to be a slave to that. Uh, and, and I go on rocketjump.com and I go and check out if I'm going to shoot a scene that's complex or if I'm trying to evoke an emotion in, in a scene with a specific shot, I go look it up. So I'm always studying, always learning, always growing. And if you have the attitude that you can do, you will do. That is so true. That is so true. I really want the audience to connect with you, see what you're doing. We know Tubi and Flex are the first thing that everybody's going to do once they've yeah. heard the broadcast. And I hope they continue on. I'd like them to connect with you on a number of different levels. So can you share with the audience where you'd like them to go and connect with yeah. you? Well, first things first, um, uh, we will very soon begin the funding of the best script I have ever read. Uh, my, my writer, Brett Miller, who wrote Ash and Bone, and he wrote Beneath Us All, the vampire movie we shot this summer. Um, he wrote a new script that absolutely, like, normally I'm a bit of a pain because I really have visions. And when I read <laughs> things, I need and ask for things because I want it to be amazing. And I read the first draft and I go, holy smokes. I don't even, I don't even know. I don't even know what what kind of notes I have. This literally blew my mind just reading it. So, uh, so we're going to be in the funding stages of that. And it is easier uh, on the independent level to jump on board and become a part of this is a lot easier than people think. So people can definitely reach out in regards to that. But uh, I am on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I am not awesome at Twitter. I'm trying to become better. Uh, I don't, it's not conversational and I'm a conversational guy, um, but, but on, on Instagram and on uh, Facebook, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very active and, Excellent. and it's very easy to get a hold of me. So look up Harley Wallen. Uh, I think it's on Instagram. I think it's, uh, the Harley Wallen. Um, so, so those places you can always uh, hang with me. My films are, we talked about Plex and we talked about Tubi, uh, a lot of them are also on Vudu, so that's another place that you can see uh, a lot of a lot of content. That uh, and and Amazon still has a bunch of my films as well. So I'm, I'm kind of kind of all over. But there's so many ways to connect, and and uh, and, I, and I, I'll say this too, I uh, I don't take any of this for granted. I don't take I don't take for granted that you wanted to do an interview with me uh, because that to me is awesome. The fact that you care enough about other people and what's going on in their lives it's beautiful uh and same thing with the viewers watching one of my films there's enough 20 to 100 million dollar movies made every 15 minutes 
that you really would never have to watch one of mine, but people choose to watch it. And I hope it gives them a good ride, but I don't take any of them for granted. My goal is to take, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, make a movie and make everybody think that it was a $10 million movie. That's kind of what I want to do. I, I want to, I want to bring my little village together and I want to create amazing content and I want as many people as possible along for the ride. I love that. And I thank you so much for such kind words. I've got to tell you, I know the audience is really, if they haven't already connected and I know that most of them probably already have, I really want them to, to do that because your vision is something that I think is an inspiration for them as well. And they're going to learn a lot as you go. And it's the growth for everybody all the way around is fantastic. I want to thank you so much for spending a little time with us to get to know you a little bit, hear about your journey and all the things that you have coming up. And I really do appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, that was, it was a great time, Rebecca. I'm happy you had me on. And I'm going to have you back. We, we Please do. Yes. You've got more stuff coming up and we definitely want to keep abreast of everything. So thank you. For sure. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for tuning into another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I just so enjoy having you tune in and connect with all of the wonderful guests today. I think that there was so much value in the things that Harley shared with you. And not only are you going to get that from today's show, but watching his films is going to give you some inspiration of your own, allow it to go in, you go internal and think about your own goals and dreams and see that they are achievable and you get to have some enjoyment while you're doing that. I ask that you like use that little button to get this out to everybody that you know on social media, your friends, your family, your loved ones, and everybody that you don't. Thanks for tuning in.